Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we keep on rolling through our pre-Jamestown colonization unit and today's episode is entitled Finding Roanoke Island. Today we're going to talk about how the British came up with and determined that Roanoke Island would be the best place for them. And we'll start today on our journey by talking about Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Last week's episode was mainly about him, and we know that he passed away, and that his half-brother, Sir Walter Raleigh, acquired his royal patent to explore and colonize America. Now, Sir Walter Raleigh was born to a British Protestant family in 1552. Just like uh, Gilbert, Raleigh's efforts to expand the Protestant church in Ireland are what brought him to prominence in England. He acquired the patent to explore and colonize America in 1584, which was actually the year before he became knighted. So Sir Walter Raleigh was somewhat of a young man. He was in his early 30s when all of this went down. Raleigh wanted to colonize America, but he did not know where to start. And instead of going himself, he sent two captains, Arthur Barlow and Philip Amadas, to explore the country for suitable colonization. Arthur Barlow's letter to Raleigh has survived the test of time, and it's what we're going to be using today to describe the voyage. So mostly what we're going to be hearing about, and you'll hear me call this the Barlow voyage, but that's what it's become. So Arthur Barlow becomes the more famous of the two captains because of his letter. Before we begin, please keep in mind that the written language here matches that of English in the late 16th century. So it sounds a little bit different than what we've been accustomed to on this program because we've been reading mostly from Spanish and French translations which occurred in later centuries. Now we're going to be reading original English from the 1580s. So I'm going to try my best to go through it and I am on the quote cards for those of you on the YouTube channel going to show the original spelling so that you can sympathize for me in what I'm reading. Barlow's fleet of two ships leaves England on April 27, 1584. They arrive at the Canaries on May 10th and then into the West Indies on June 10th. They began working their way north along Florida's eastern coastline. They continue north until they reach the Pamlico Sound on July 4th. The Pamlico Sound, which if you're from the area, you probably know easily what that is. It's the Bay of Water that separates mainland North Carolina from those islands east. It looks like a long sandbar when you're looking on a map. At this point, they land somewhere within the sound and two days later, they come upon some local natives. Let's have a look at the writing. The day we spied one small boat rowing towards us, having in it three persons, this boat came to the island, and there two of the people remaining, the third came along the shore side towards us, and we being then all within board, we walked up and down upon the point of the land next unto us. Then the master and the pilot of the admiral, Simon Ferdinando, and the captain Philip Amadis, myself and others, rode to land, whose coming this fellow attended, never making any show of fear or doubt. So the natives were approachable, were friendly, uh, well, I'll say friendly, it doesn't, even though it doesn't really say that. It says a lot, but it doesn't necessarily say that. And of course, you're getting the idea of how uh, 16th century British this writing is. The natives, you know, greet them well. 
Barlow's men give the natives some clothing, and then the natives go fishing and share some of their catch with the men. So early indications are that the natives are a hunter-gatherer type. Fishing is one of their food sources. And so that's kind of, that's good for us to know. The next day, the king of the tribe's brother, so not the king, but his brother, along with 40 to 50 other natives, come and meet the expedition. Let's look at the writing. When he came to the place, his servants spread a long mat upon the ground, on which he sat down, and at the other end of the mat, four others of his company did the like. The rest of his men stood around him. Somewhere afar off, when we came to the shore to him with our weapons, he never moved from his place, nor any of the other four, nor never mistrusted any harm to be offered from us, but sitting still he beckoned us to come and sit by him, which we performed. While we don't know Barlow's extent of experience interacting with natives, Barlow seems impressed at the poise that this native leader and his four other members there sitting with him have. Poise is something we haven't seen much of in our writings either up to this point. So Barlow may have some additional experience dealing with the native population or reading about it at least. So these groups have a pleasant exchange of goods. They communicate with each other. And during this meeting, the reason for the king not being present along with some insight into the region itself, is given. Let's have a look. The king is greatly obeyed, and his brothers and children reverenced. The king himself in person was at our being there, sore wounded in a fight, which he had with the king of the next country, called Wingina and was shot in two places through the body, and once clean through the thigh. But yet he recovered, by reason whereof, and for that he lay at the chief town of the country, being six days' journey off, we saw him not at all. So this man had been wounded in battle, he, he was recovering, but he was six days away. So that is why... Uh, the king was not there. Now, obviously, we're keeping on the back of our minds the Roanoke colony, and we all know sort of what happens there, or the mystery that follows. And so the fact that we have the presence of other natives and hostilities occurring in the area is a key issue for us to note later on. A couple of days later, Barlow and his men engage in trading once again with the natives. The expedition trades freely with them unless the king's brother is present. At that point, the king's brother is the only person they are allowed to trade with. At one point, the king's brother becomes interested in British armor and swords but the British were not willing to trade with him for them. So this part's a bit interesting because you think, would the British want to trade weapons with a native or foreign entity? And they did not. Barlow goes on to mention that the natives feed them well and that the natives had ample fruits, melons, walnuts, cucumbers, gourds, peas, and roots. He also adds that the soil is rich and plentiful. From there, the natives decide to take him to an island. Let's have a look at the writing. After they had been aboard our ships, myself, 
with seven more went twenty mile into the river that runneth toward the city of Skikoke, which river they call Ockham. And the evening following, we came to an island which they call Roanoke. So that's how the name Roanoke came about, and that's how the location came about. And if you're on the audio version of our podcast, I would definitely love for you to come over and watch the version on YouTube, especially with this quote card, because of how complicated that looks. We are in for the long haul when it comes to early colonial history, I can tell you that. Barlow went on to note that there were nine houses already on the island, and the north part of the island was fortified by what he called sharp trees, likely pines. The king's brother's wife lived here and greeted the group very well. She even washed and dried the clothes of many members of the expedition. Now that leads me to another question, and that is how apparently in their culture they must have washed or dried their own clothing or something because for her to know to do that is fascinating in and of itself. And possibly these natives now in this area have had plenty of experience with Europeans. But uh, it's just interesting that the, the, the king's brother's wife goes so far as to wash and dry the clothes of members of the expedition. That evening, three native hunters returned to the island, and there was a misunderstanding regarding their intentions. And I think it was because the British saw men with weapons, and the British got a little guarded and reserved, and the hunters got a little guarded and reserved, and so the women of the village asked the hunters to leave to ensure the guests would feel safe. Barlow goes on to mention that there are two other villages in the area that are allied with these natives, but they are independently governed. And then he says something astounding about another tribe. Let's have a look. Towards the southwest, four days' journey is situated a town called Sikotan, which is the southernmost town of Wingenkoa, near unto which six and twenty years past there was a ship cast away, whereof some of the people were saved and those were white people whom the country people preserved. So other Europeans were in the area 26 years prior. And if we do the math and we look at what we know, it is likely these individuals were associated with the French Huguenots' attempt to colonize just to the south in South Carolina. But there is no real indication as to what happened to them. Barlow goes on to mention that the wars amongst the natives in this region are rather brutal. So the violence between the native tribes is rather bad. And again, that's something we need to know. Barlow at this point decides to return to England and he takes with him two natives. So there's two natives with Barlow heading back to England. So the report ends up, which we kind of read from here, going to Sir Walter Raleigh. And Sir Walter Raleigh is encouraged by the report and he decides to choose Roanoke Island as the site for colonization. And to achieve this, he brings in his cousin, Sir Richard Grenville, to help. So we go to the settling of the Roanoke colony next time 
on historical context. Thank you.